sooner or later we were always going to have to deal with the topic of that. So this isn't a pleasure yacht, this isn't going to be a place where we can have a shower block, uh, it's not big enough, we're only 25 feet long, um, but we were also not going to be able to have enough space to, uh, to sort of set off an entire section of the boat just for, uh, I guess what you call ablutions. And so because it's an expedition boat and people who are on expeditions together are normally very used to, um, let's say, sort of the more intimate side of, uh, of, of daily human animal existence, means that uh, the fact that we have a what, what I guess we would call an open air uh, or um, a one cabin head system here, uh, it's just going to be the reality of life on board Alan. Uh, it doesn't mean that we won't try and make it as pleasant as possible, but at the same time, this is what we're going to have. And it's not going to be in the living area, which is at the uh, towards the bow of the boat. It's going to be more the sort of the technical and uh, working part of the boat, which is towards the stern. Anyhow, this is what we've... Um, this is what we've come up with and it's basically um, a bucket built into the side of the boat and I'll just show you a little bit more here about how it's all been put together and about how it will work. Most importantly, how it's going to seal. This is likely to be the least frequented corner of the boat's interior and so it makes sense to place the heads here. It's strictly a solid waste receptacle. As is completely normal for expedition life in its daily routine, when out and about you tend to make either use of the Great Beyond for number ones or a specially labelled Nalgene bottle if in a tent or a cabin. You don't want to get your water bottles mixed up. This does of course massively simplify the practicalities of number twos and reduces the liquid volume. A teammate of mine found a head's upper section and so I disinfected and then sanded it back to a good key. The whole area around the heads needs to be easy to clean and to differentiate it from the rest of the gel coat so I must off a zone around it. Since there are all sorts of materials, filler, wood, plastic and gel coat, I needed to do a pretty thorough priming job of the whole area with the Zinsa. Ok, you'll notice I'm using a small detail brush. I started off with this to go around the hinges and narrower sections, and then I frankly thought it would take longer to get that brush cleaned and replaced with a larger brush than just to get it done. So I got it done. The final finish would be later on with an oil based top coat anyhow. And here is that top coat. I'm a big fan of a particular high opacity white top coat which is supposed to be for bilges and lockers but I find the tough semi-gloss finish, oil resistance and value for money makes it pretty useful. It also adheres to the Zinsa Primer really nicely. Inside, the scooped out foam is pretty rough but that's ok as I have a deep plastic container to provide the shape for the receptacle. I found a couple of them for a few quid on Amazon as flower planters. Right shape and the right plastic. My plan for lining the heads isn't too complex either. Neatly fitted into the tub is a heavy duty bin liner. This will take care of any accidents and protect the tub and the foam. It will stay there permanently unless said accident occurs. Then inside will be a compostable liner. I've tested tons of these, of different organic materials and thickness gauges. Finally I found one that can handle weight, moisture and even some pressure on the seams for a prolonged period. It means that on an expedition, human waste can be easily dropped off overboard with zero plastics contamination. In more coastal regions, we'd have the option to use more normal options too. There you go. Heads. And probably not as you've ever seen them before on a boat conversion. I cannot imagine the extent of shock and horror this is going to invite in the comment section. Make them imaginative, please. Enough of the heads. Let's talk about engine cowling. The original fiberglass cowling for the engine from the lifeboat design was enormous, wildly heavy and was also there to double as seating for some of the 60 odd inhabitants of a fully occupied lifeboat. I wanted something more lightweight, yet robust, shaped to sit around the engine bay more tightly, yet still allow for good cooling and ventilation for the three cylinder turbo diesel. My construction is a wooden frame. Onto this I've mounted thin board and then laminated a waterproofing and abrasion resistant outer skin of glass fiber and then glazed all the exposed areas with an epoxy resin. I thinned this with some acetone beforehand to make sure it brushed on better and this should seal the surface well against moisture and provide a good surface for paints and adhesives. I want to do three things with the cowling. First have a structure that can be stood on and used. Second to reduce sound from the diesel as well as possible. It will never be a soft purr like from a modern petrol engine, but it can surely be muffled as well as can be. Finally, I want to control heat from the engine block, turbo and exhaust. At least to make sure the cowling itself, which forms a closer shell over the engine than the original, isn't damaged. I've added in sheets of acoustic foam over the larger panels of the interior. Using a couple of different types of adhesive, sort of similar to when I was doing the boat installation, 
I want to make sure there's a good instant grab and also a lasting high temperature bond. The last thing I want is the soundproofing coming away and touching hot parts of the engine. Then, foiling everything in neatly. I've selected wide strips of adhesive aluminium foil tape, rated for industrial work as elevated temperatures, and then a more robust reinforced foil sealing tape around the detailed areas. I'm always skeptical of the heat ratings of off-the-shelf self-adhesive products, so I'm going to keep an eye on this in the early days. The temperature in the engine bay will be actively vented though, the foil will of course reflect heat away from the foam and cowling structure, and there's not to be any zones of really close proximity between the cowling and a hot zone like the turbocharger or unlagged exhaust pipe. The cowling is inverted here, and along the base I've bonded on a thick strip of rubber, then bedded it in with high modular sealant. This will, with some downward compression, later allow for a good seal with the gel coat floor once installed around the engine. You'll see that I've chopped the cowling in half. I did this at the last moment, once happy that the cowling as a whole sat squaring correctly over the engine bay. Having jigsawed the three cross beams, I could then attach the two halves using stainless brackets and M6 nuts, washers and bolts. Whenever I bolt wood, I use a large penny washer to make sure the pressure of the fixing doesn't crush the wood fibres. This division allows a couple of things. First, that it's easier to lift and get through the hatches. Second, that once installed, I could remove one half and leave the other in place if I need access to the engine for maintenance. Then time for some paint. A few areas didn't need foiling, so I coated them with my favourite cheap and cheerful top coat for completion's sake. The rest of the job was to complete the foiling. The cowling has been a love-hate thing for me. If you saw it in a furniture shop, you'd probably not be clamouring to take it to the till. It's been a slow, long ongoing project since the earliest days after buying Alan, but now completed, I'm pretty chuffed with Alan's engine's jacket. I'm not ready to install it yet, as the engine isn't finished, but soon. To head off the inevitable comments about edges and corners, there is a master plan, and I will share it later, I promise. Do, however, feel free to comment regardless, as apparently it pleases the algorithm gods. I know you will. Now, let's look at a small detail job on Alan's exterior. His great gel coat painting day is coming, once the temperatures in the UK are comfortably around 15 Celsius, and I can get a day or two with no rain forecast. But in the meantime, I want to complete the early surface prep. I'll do the sanding of the surface to provide a key for the paint at the last moment, but this is one extra job. Around the hatches and windows are fixing bolt heads. Over the winter when British weather shockingly delivered some prolonged periods of rain, I noticed a few drops of water on the inside of the shell, and they clearly come through these bolt holes. Whilst Alan isn't ancient, I'd noticed some of the exterior sealant was perishing a little, so I thought it was time to act now, before the paint job. These are permanent bolts, so need for access is unlikely. I've sealed with a low modulus polymer mastic and then capped with a small plastic dome. Finally, I've done a test with the famous Zinser primer to check that it takes properly to the plastic. Success! I can do all of these now, ready to be top coated. To prove I do read your comments, well, the ones that aren't deranged anyhow, I've tweaked a couple of things in past videos. Firstly, an abrasion-resistant Kevlar strip to stop the stainless hose braid cutting into the gel coat. A quick trick here to get something floppy through a conduit like this steel channel. I've taped the strip to the end of a length of spare thin aluminium bar, which allowed me to push it through and then remove the metal bar. Job done. Finally, and wow the comments turn out for this would have been enough for me to win an election. So, I brought this job forward and installed a nitrile grommet into the fiberglass panel here to protect the fuel hose from vibration abrasion. I've also reversed one of these hose clips, as these are a couple I'm not going to be changing over to the superior permanent O-clips in the coming days. Now, one final thing to discuss with you. Please do hang on a moment, as it's something I've given a lot of thought. This channel isn't only destined for work on Alan. In fact, I created it as a platform to release Arctic mini documentaries through, but with all the border closures this winter, it shifted my focus. I also want to release a whole load of other content that interests me. Don't worry, Alan will now certainly be at the core of it, but essentially I want to invest a great deal of time and effort into it, increasingly so. It's going to need to make sense business-wise, and a load of you have kindly offered your ideas about playing the YouTube monetization game with ads and so on. Look, ads on YouTube are things of nightmares. I don't want to use them. I also don't want to do ridiculous and unconvincing product promotions, not least because then you won't trust the choice of products I'm testing or using. 
As with my Polar Expedition partnerships, I'm very strict about only working with companies I've genuinely used and trusted, and when actively involved with their research and development processes. So, no ads and no trying to product place the latest plant-based marine engine oil that also doubles as an organic hair conditioner. I also don't want to use Patreon or similar platforms. There's too much chance of getting locked into a system that then totally changes its business model or applies some bizarre politically motivated crackdown on its users. So let's go direct. In the descriptions there will be a link to my website where you can help me increase the quality and scope of my original videos and films. A total of 20% of the monthly total will be donated to relevant charities too, so check out the details on the webpage. Contributors are entered into a draw each month to help choose which charity. I'm going to add to the options and maybe offer some extra things for sale as time goes on. Also, you can always buy my books too, which is a massive help in a world where I'm competing with thousands of self-help and celebrity cooking books. Mine are better, unless you want to learn how to cook. Mine don't help with that. Bye.